I'm really happy to be here today, and I think this entire um, event is a really cool thing because it's really important to build interest in science at an early age. And I wish I had had exposure to something like this when I was um, young, younger. So um, I'm at the University of Iowa right now, and I've been there for about a year and a half. It's over in Iowa City. And before that, I worked at uh, UT Southwestern. That's where I started my um, faculty career. I was assistant professor of the psychiatry and biochemistry departments there for about six years. And um, right now, I have a number of different projects going on um, involving ways to figure out what causes mental illness and how can we develop new ways to treat it. Um, the project I'm going to talk about today um, is one that evolved from my work when I was at UT Southwestern. And I think it illustrates a really important part about science that everybody should know from the beginning, which is that you really have to work with other people to accomplish anything that I feel is, is meaningful. And you just can't do it by yourself, especially now in the current funding climate and challenges and the magnitude of the techniques and, that we have at our disposal. And so all the work that I'm gonna talk about today has been done um, in equal partnership and collaboration with two other uh, professors at the University of Texas. One is uh, Steve McKnight, he's the chairman of biochemistry there, and the other is um, Joe Reedy, he's a synthetic organic chemist. And the three of us together have been working on um, developing these series of molecules that we hope we can turn into a neuroprotective drug. Because right now there is no form of treatment for any of the wide variety of neurologic diseases that we have. Um, if you get Alzheimer's or Huntington's or Parkinson's disease, there's nothing that can stop the progression of cell death in the brain. And so um, even if you can temporarily treat the symptoms, the disease marches on and it's devastating for patients and it's devastating for families. So there's a tremendous need for drugs that might stop the process of death of those cells. So I first got interested in this in kind of a roundabout way. After I finished my psychiatry residency, I went to do a postdoc um, fellowship with uh, Steve McKnight. And he had discovered this family of genes called the NPAS genes. And it isn't necessarily important what these do, except I'll tell you that they are um, what's called transcription factors. And so they're proteins that bind to DNA and they control the expression of genes, which are parts of the DNA that, that then make us become uh, who we are. And they control everything that the cell does. And these particular genes were uh, restricted to the brain, but nobody knew what they did. Independently of uh, Dr. McKnight's discovery of the NPAS family of transcription factors, a totally different group in Canada had, had done a, a blind screen in, a, patient, in a, a family with schizophrenia, and they found that this gene was disrupted. So that's how I became interested in NPAS3. Um, you've seen these pedigrees in the earlier talks. This is the mom. Um, who has schizophrenia, and this is her daughter who also has schizophrenia. We, we don't know what happened to the son because he ended up being homeless and was lost to follow up. But they did a whole genetic analysis where they, they just looked at what was wrong with the DNA of the patients with schizophrenia. And what they found was that there was one big, huge change, and that was that um, this chromosome number nine was, was broken, and chromosome number 14 was broken, and they had rejoined in such a way that the end result was that this particular gene, NPAS3, was basically cut in half right here. So what's shown here is a schematic of the NPAS3 gene. And the breakpoint right here where the chromosomes were broken um, resulted in inactivating the gene because it separated the part of the gene that codes for the DNA binding domain from the part of the gene that codes for the activation domain, essentially making it as if the people did not have that gene. So I was, um, when I started my postdoc, I, I went to Steve McKnight's lab, and my project was to figure out what it is that NPAS3 does, because although we had used the technology of DNA that we've all been talking about today to figure out that this gene was involved in the disease, we didn't know what it did in the disease. But the idea is that if you can uh, figure out what it does in the disease, then you might be able to develop treatments. So we used all types of technology, and, and it took about two years, and um, did various experiments where we uh, eliminated the gene from mice to see what it might do. We looked at what um, analogous versions of the gene do in lower organisms like uh, the fruit fly. And we figured out that it controls this uh, system of signaling in the brain that's called the fibroblast growth factor system. And um, we also figured out that when we looked at where it's expressed in the brain, is it was expressed very highly in a region of the brain called the hippocampus, which is a part of the brain that's important in learning and memory. A long time ago, it was discovered by a a guy named Phineas Gage who had a, a tamping rod go through his head that uh, his memory was destroyed. And that was because it turned out that that was the perfect destruction of the hippocampus in his brain. And so that now we know the hippocampus is important in learning and memory. 
that happened to be where this gene is expressed. And we showed that this gene controls the signaling system that controls this process right here, known as hippocampal neurogenesis. So anybody here learn in high school that we actually make new brain cells um, in our brain every day? OK. Oh, you did? Oh, good. That's awesome. Yeah, Malcolm Gladwell, he writes a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. So when I was in high school, we just learned that you are stuck with what you got. And you, <laughs> and it's as soon, basically as soon as you're born, it's downhill from there. And so you should try to save them as much as possible. But it actually turns out that there are a couple of regions of the brain where we make new cells every day. Um, and one of those regions is the hippocampus. And that's important in learning and memory. It's not quite known what the exact role of neurogenesis is, but it's known that the process goes down in a lot of different neurodegenerative diseases. It goes down in some forms of mental illness, um, particularly in untreated mental illness. It also goes down, for example, after people are exposed to uh, stress, such as in combat, for example, so it might be involved in post-traumatic stress disorder. Nonetheless, the take-home message here is that um, the hippocampus resides inside the brain, and it's sort of the relay station for new um, information. So as we navigate through our world, information comes in through the sensory system, which goes first through the cerebral cortex, which is the outer layering of the cover, uh, outer layering of your brain. And then it gets shuttled to the hippocampus, and the hippocampus has this sort of three-part circuit here. Um, the information is processed by signaling between um, brain cells through here, and then sent back out to the cerebral cortex, where it's stored um, in a modified manner that's thought to somehow help um, organisms adapt to a changing environment. And what's unique about the hippocampus is that this region right here, this V-shaped structure that I'm trying to highlight, um, is called the dentate gyrus. And on the inside of this V-shaped structure is where we make new cells every day of our lives. And that's shown in schematic form um, right here. We have these um, cells that aren't, they aren't um, neurons yet, and they aren't supportive cells for the brain. What they are are um, a, a form of advanced stem cell that can become different types of cells that function in the brain. And something activates them. Nobody's quite sure what that is, but something activates them to then start replicating, and then they multiply, and eventually they either die or they differentiate, um, and they become neurons where they, they sit in this layer, this white layer right here, and they extend processes out here, and they form connections to help that circuit function. And what is bizarre, um, which nobody really understands why, is that the vast majority of these cells die. So we make... A, we make um, for every 100 cells we make here, about 90 of them are dead by day 30. And only a small portion of them become neurons that then function. So the brain makes an excessive number of those cells. Nobody knows why. But you can measure this process by injecting animals with um, a compound called bromodeoxyuridine. There are four base pairs of DNA, um, A, T, C, G. We've been talking about those this morning. And BRDU, bromodeoxyuridine, is an analog of thymidine. But what's different about it is that it has a, a bromine group on it that then you can look at under the microscope through a variety of different techniques that we use in the lab. And so you can actually use this technique um, by injecting animals with BRDU to visualize how many new cells are made in the brain. And um, in the process of figuring out what the NPAS3 gene does um, to control this process, I became really interested in hippocampal neurogenesis and realized that this system that's going on every day um, in the brain could serve as a way to detect new molecules that might block cell death. Because right now, the way that all drugs are usually discovered is that they, they, take, they grow neurons in a dish, or they, eat, or they just put chemicals in a dish that they know works with a pathway that might be involved in cell death, for example. And then they, they do a, a screening of a million compounds to try to find something that blocks that process. Problem with that is that sometimes, and often, in fact, what you find in the dish doesn't work in the animal. And, um, what I wanted to do was find something that works in the animal because I reasoned that if it works in the animal, it's going to be more likely to ultimately work in a person than starting at an earlier stage. So um, I designed this screen when I started on the faculty there at UT Southwestern where I, I took this large chemical compound library at um, it was about 250,000 different small molecules that had been collected from different drug companies. They had no known function. And the chemists at UT Southwestern identified um, a thousand molecules that they said were representative of the whole um, library and that also had um, various characteristics that would make them favorable for drug development if they were found to have a, a positive uh, beneficial biologic function. 
and then <clears throat> I infused them directly into the brains of mice, and the goal was to find a molecule that would block the death of these new cells in the hippocampus. Um, and it didn't matter to me how it did it. It was completely blind to mechanism. It was just, I just wanted to find a molecule that would work, um, that could maybe help ultimately fill this need that, that we have for a new medicine. So loaded the compounds uh, 10 at a time at a very low concentration um, into uh, these Alzette osmotic mini pumps, which we plant, implant in the back of the mouse underneath the skin. And then the pumps are hooked up to a cannula, which is like a, a really thin straw that feeds into the cerebral spinal fluid circulatory system of, of the mouse. So within the brain and the spinal cord, there's, there's stuff called cerebral spinal fluid that circulates um, constantly. And there's problems with getting drugs into the brain in that there's a thing called a blood-brain barrier because the brain needs to be protected so that it's not exposed to everything you encounter in the environment. But for a screen, that's not ideal. So I tried to circumvent that problem by pumping compounds directly into the cerebral spinal fluid so that I could just find something that worked, and then if I found something that worked, we could later chemically modify it to, to be able to cross the blood-brain barrier. So for a one-week period of time, these compounds um, were infused at a constant rate into the um, ventricular system of the brain. And then every day during that one week, I injected the mice with BRDU, which again is that analog of thymidine, which can mark newborn cells. And then at the end of the uh, seven days, I would uh, dissect out the brain, and cut um, uh, in really, really fine, thin, thin, fine sections every um, place from where the hippocampus starts to where the hippocampus ends. And so the hippocampus is at the front of the brain is smaller, and then as you go to the back of the brain, it becomes bigger. And you can see, hopefully, this dentate gyrus section, it, dentate gyrus gets bigger and bigger. And then what I did was I looked under the microscope and I just counted how many new black dots had been made. And the black dot is a new cell that was formed during this process. And so normally what we would see is uh, about this number of black dots in a, um, in a section. But whenever we would find a pool of compounds that enhanced uh, the production or the survival of new cells, it would look something like this. Many more dots are, are made. And so we could actually count those. And then it was pretty laborious. Um, it's about 15 sections. and. We, uh, hundreds of mice, and um, we could normalize it for the volume of this structure of the dentate gyrus by tracing out the area and multiplying times the thickness of the section. And that was really important because you have to standardize everything from animal to animal. So to make a very long story short, after a couple of years, we found eight different molecules that enhanced this process. And because it was during a one week period of time, they could work either by enhancing the birth of those cells or by blocking their death once they've been born. And the one I'm gonna talk about today is, is this one that's shown here. I named it P7C3 because it was um, from pool number seven, compound number three. And um, the reason that we have used this one the most is that uh, when we used computer modeling to predict the ability of the eight different molecules that we found to cross the blood-brain barrier, the computer told us this one will definitely cross the blood-brain barrier and the other ones have no chance in their current state. And so we moved forward with this one because we wanted to get around having to use the pumps and we wanted to test it in other models of disease to see if it might work. What I've shown here is simply that when mice are fed P7C3, um, you know, orally administered P7C3, that there are many more new neurons that are made um, in the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus than in mice that are given um, what's called vehicle, which is the solution that the P7C3 is dissolved in. And then <clears throat> after that, we have basically had three different, um, three different wings of the project. One is to figure out how does the molecule work, because although it works um, in vivo, we don't know how. And if we can discover how, then we can um, potentially make some very important discoveries about science, but also develop new screening tools to identify um, other things that might work in the same pathway. We don't know how it works yet. We think it works um, perhaps through energy dynamics, perhaps through helping the mitochondria survive. But I, I don't have any answer for that today. The other two things we've been working on are um, improving the molecule for drug development and finding out different models of disease in which the molecule might work. So I'll talk about the, the, briefly about improving the molecule. So this molecule itself is not suitable for uh, making a drug. What we wanted to do was we wanted to make it even more potent. We also wanted to uh, fix perceived uh, liabilities of this if this were to become a drug. And so two of those liabilities are these uh, bromine groups are 
for various reasons, considered to be not optimal for drug development. Um, and another one is the, this um, aniline group right here. So an aniline group is this ring structure adjacent to a nitrogen, and it's considered to be a reactive group that might have problems um, when given to people um, in the cell. And so we've worked really hard to basically, with Joridi, we've, we've replaced almost every single atom around this molecule. We've made almost 300 different versions of the P7C3 molecule, and we've come up with two that work very well. And our, uh, our first improved one was P7C3 A20, analog number 20. And it was different from P7C3 chiefly by the fact that we substituted a fluorine group in for the hydroxyl group here. And that actually increases activity um, tremendously and, and caused some other um, improvements that helped it uh, look more favorable. However, um, one problem with this molecule is that it still had this aniline ring. And another problem is that it's made as a, what's called a raspic mixture. So, uh, some of you probably in chemistry have learned about chirality, which is that molecules can have a left-handed or a right-handed form. And drugs today are, um, it's preferable if drugs today are made as a single enantiomer, either, either the right or the left. And in fact, usually if it's a specific binding, um, if the drug has a specific binding partner, then one of those enantiomers will work and the other one will be much less active or won't work at all. It's very difficult to make analog number 20 as a single enantiomer, but we can do that much more readily with analog number 243. And so, um, so yeah, several, long, long time afterward, uh, we, we got rid of the aniline group by replacing this nitrogen. If we put nitrogens in these other locations, or other atoms in these other locations, we lose activity. But this, this molecule, 243, actually has a slightly better activity than A20 and works very well um, in our different animal models, which I'll show you. And it also can be readily made as a single enantiomer, and it's the R enantiomer that has the activity. The S enantiomer is much less active, almost, almost inactive. So we have looked at these different models of neurologic disease. I'm not going to show you data from each one. That would take a long time. But a lot of it has been published, and I'll show you two pieces of unpublished um, data. But basically, we started looking at things that were thought to work through neurogenesis, and that chiefly that was initially learning memory. And so with the initial discovery of P7C3, I gave it that original compound to aged rats and saw that um, normally those rats have a decline in neurogenesis and they have a decline in their ability to learn in this thing called the Morris water maze, which is where they had to remember where a, a platform is um, submerged underwater. And when I was, um, I was able to block that decline in learning in aged rats by giving them the P7C3 molecule every day for two months. And that increased their neurogenesis, it blocked um, cell death in other parts of the brain also, and it improved their ability to learn. So it, we published those results uh, along with the original discovery of P7C3 and said, hey, this might work to prevent cognitive decline that happens uh, with aging if that involves hippocampal neurogenesis. Um, but then the big next question was, if it blocks cell death in the hippocampus of those particular newborn cells, would it also block the death of mature neurons other places in the brain and perhaps in the spinal cord also? Because those are the diseases right now that, that um, <clears throat> are afflicting millions and millions of people and there's no treatment for it. And so we looked um, initially at two different models. One uh, model of Parkinson's disease, another model of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Um, the model of Parkinson's disease that we published is what's called the MPTP model of Parkinson's disease. And this is simply a toxin that kills the same cells in the brain that die in patients that have Parkinson's disease. And it's actually interesting how it was discovered. It was discovered um, um, in young people who showed up in the emergency room with Parkinson's disease and nobody understood why. And it turned out that they were trying to make um, an analog of um, heroin. Um, for a recreational drug, and they made it incorrectly, and it was contaminated with this compound. And from that, it was discovered that this compound can serve as a model for Parkinson's disease. So we, sh we showed and we published that injection of MPTP, um, followed by um, administration of our compounds, um, we were able to block that cell death occurring by MPTP. And then we looked at a different model as well, which I'll show you some data for, um, which is a another toxin that works similarly. We also used a genetic model of um, ALS. Again, DNA is very important. Um, these <laughs> nobody knows what causes ALS. It's degeneration of spinal cord motor neurons as well as motor neurons in the central nervous system. And um, 
there's no treatment for it. There hasn't been a treatment developed for it. There's one drug, but it doesn't extend life very long. And basically, it's, it's, um, it's once you have it, it's going to progress, and there's nothing you can do about it. The, a small percentage of patients that have ALS have mutations in this gene called superoxide dismutase. And a small percentage of those patients that have a mutation in superoxide dismutase have this particular mutation, which results in changing amino acid 93 from uh, glycine to an alanine. And so people developed a, a transgenic model of um, ALS. When transgenic means they insert this particular mutant gene and they insert several copies of it. And um, when you do that, the mice develop symptoms just like patients with ALS, and it happens at a very predictable, regular um, period of time. And so what we did was we took these mice and we waited until they developed symptoms, and then we started to give our protective compound. Um, in this case, it was P7C3A20, because that's the only one we had at the time. And we showed that we were able to um, dramatically, significantly slow down the, the, the loss of um, motor neurons in the spinal cord, and that that correlated with improved um, motor ability on this um, task called the accelerating rotor rod, where you put a mouse on a, a turning wheel and you just keep accelerating it until the mouse falls off. And as these mice get sick, they lose the motor neurons in their spinal cord that control their movement and they're not able to stay on for as long a period of time. Giving these mice P7C3A20 slowed the death of those cells and allowed them to stay on longer period of time at a um, more advanced age. We've also done some work in collaboration with um, a surgeon named Greg Borchel at the uh, at Toronto, University of Toronto on peripheral nerve crush injury. And this is um, a model of a condition called obstetric brachial plexus palsy, where um, there's a, a bundle of nerves here that is damaged often during the birth process. It's called the brachial plexus. And um, there isn't any kind of medical way to, to block degeneration of those nerves. So it's strictly a surgical um, repair that's done, and it's often not completely effective, and so um, patients who suffer this at birth, they grow up with sensory and sometimes pain and um, almost always um, some degree of motor problems with the affected limb. So what he does is he models this in neonatal mice, and he showed that uh, when he crushes those nerves in a way that, that um, some people believe mimics um, obstetric brachial plexus palsy, and then starts to give our protective compound that he's able to substantially restore function. It doesn't completely fix it, but the idea is that if that were done in combination with surgical techniques, that we could improve outcome in, in patients. And currently, this manuscript's under review right now. Uh, we just had a paper accepted to molecular psychiatry on the role of major depression. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that um, some forms of chronic mental illness are associated with decreased neurogenesis in the hippocampus, and we have a particular mouse model that has that. And when we stress it, the mouse behaves in a way that um, mimics some things that people do when they're depressed. And that pushes down neurogenesis, depresses it. And when we are able to elevate neurogenesis back up to normal levels with our compounds, we're able to um, restore normal behavior in the mouse. And then finally, we've been looking at uh, traumatic brain injury. We've done two different models. We, we just published a paper in Journal of Neurotrauma on um, this technique called lateral fluid percussion injury, which is um, we did um, uh, in very close collaboration in the lab of Dalton Dietrich at the University of Miami, and that is basically an, an impact um, on the surface of the protective covering of the brain called the, the dura matter. He, um, and then in my lab at University of Iowa, we've been looking at a blast, <coughs> blast injury model. So in the few minutes that we have left, I will show you some data on this model of Parkinson's disease and this model of um, traumatic brain injury. So the problem with the MPTP model um, in mice was that mice don't develop behavioral symptoms. And, and in science, it's really good to have both uh, something in the brain that you can see change as well as a behavior that correlates with that. But mice are really resistant to behavioral problems associated with loss of the dopaminergic neurons that die in Parkinson's disease. And so they don't develop any motor symptoms. But rats, on the other hand, are very sensitive to it. And so um, we injected this toxin, 6-hydroxydopamine, directly into um, the processes of the cells that die in Parkinson's disease. And then they take it up, and then they get wiped out. And so we inject it only on one side. And so these cells are shown here in green. They're stained for the enzyme that, that makes dopamine, which is what those cells um, produce. And it's loss of dopamine in that region that, that is caused, causes the symptoms in Parkinson's disease. And in the side that we inject it, we lose all those cells completely. When we then administer, when we do that with the administration of either our A20 analog or our new um, S243 analog, however, we completely block that 
loss of cells. So we're able to protect those cells from dying. And in rats, we can correlate this with behavior because if you think about it, um, the motor function, everything in the brain is on two sides. And so if you wipe out one side the, of the motor system, which we're doing here, it's imbalanced. And then we can drive behavior by giving the mice or the rats um, amphetamine. Normally, the amphetamine will just make them move a lot more because both sides are equal. But in the mouse that has one side of its motor system missing, it'll, or the rat that has one side of its motor system missing, it'll turn around in circles because uh, this side is, is, is driven faster, this side is not driven at all. And so the assay is simply, can we cause circling when we give the toxin and can we block the circling when we give the protective compound? And that's what we see. So this is a, a normal mouse that wasn't even given the toxin, but it was given amphetamine and this is a, a little bit more active than a, I keep saying mice, it's a rat. It's a little bit more active than a, than a rat normally is in this assay. And then this is a rat that received the 6-hydroxydopamine toxin and was not given our protective compound. And you can see it, it's just turning around in circles because its motor system is, is being stimulated, but it only has one side of its motor system functioning. So it turns around in circles. And then when we give our uh, protective compound along with the toxin, um, I'll, I'll show you this one for 243, we, we do not see that circling behavior. I don't know why that one's not loading up. Let me try this one. Okay, so both A20 and 243 protected from the circling behavior. And so this is a mouse that got 6-hydroxydopamine and then our protective compound. And it, um, after amphetamine, it, it moves more, but it doesn't turn around in circles uh, the way that this one did. Uh, this movie was just added to the slide and apparently I didn't add it correctly. <laughs> so uh, the other model that I wanna show you data for really fast is this model of traumatic brain injury called uh, blast injury. And this is thought to mimic, for example, what happens to soldiers when a, a, a bomb goes off in their vicinity. It sends a blast wave through their brain. It's a different form of injury than a concussive injury. And it actually seems that it, it, rather than kill the cells themselves, what it does is it breaks the connections the cells make between each other. So neurons connect with each other by virtue of axons. And it, it seems to break those axons and cause them to degrade. And we model this in mice by putting them in this chamber where the mouse is on this side and it's in, um, it's in a restrained chamber, and its entire body is shielded, except for its head, which is exposed. And then this is the pressure chamber, and these two chambers are separated by um, a mylar membrane. So as we increase the pressure on this side, the membrane swells until it bursts, and different membranes will burst at a different um, level of pounds per square inch uh, PSI. So we used uh, 20 PSI, which is a pretty standard injury. And the experiment that we did was expose mice to um, to this blast injury, wait 24 hours, and then start to give them our protective compounds because we reasoned that 24 hours is, it, it's almost everybody could get treatment within 24 hours. You, you don't always know when you're gonna have an injury so you can't pre-treat patients, but certainly within 24 hours you could, uh, you could treat most of the people that had a blast exposure. And then we gave comp our protective compound, in this case it was S243, every day for the next, for the rest of the experiment for the, about the next two weeks. And then we train them in this task called the Barnes maze. And the way this works is that the mouse is put on this open table, it's elevated about this high, and all around the perimeter of the table are these holes. And the mouse doesn't like to be on uh, the open table because that's an inherently anxious position for the mouse to be in. People think maybe it's because it's, when the mouse is exposed, it, it fears that it could be eaten, whether consciously or unconsciously. But in any case, the mouse is motivated to try to get out of the open area. But every single one of these holes, if it goes in any of these holes, it's gonna fall down. And the mouse doesn't wanna fall down either. But one of the holes has this protective cup, which I've shown here in yellow. And so the mouse learns over time, over the course of several days, where that cup is located. And it remembers where that cup is located by using its hippocampus to remember where these different cues are that are hung around the room. And so they're hung in the same place every day. And we put the mouse back on the table. And over time, it learns more quickly how to find that uh, protective cup. And then it goes there and it stays because it doesn't like to be on the open uh, table. And then um, to test how well it remembers this, we, <laughs> we then um, take the cup away and put the mouse on the table and we time how many times does the mouse keep looking in the same place where the cup was. And it, how many times does it, does it move within a, within a very close um, centimeter radius of the location of the cup. 
normally, um, it should, an uninjured mouse will spend between 40 and 50% of its time looking where that cup was because it's learned really well. After the injury, it only spends about um, 15%, 15 to 20% because it doesn't remember where it is and it's just sort of by chance or it doesn't remember nearly as well. But when we give escalating doses of our protective compound over time, we're able to fully restore uh, the ability of the mouse to remember where that, um, where that cup was. And these are very large numbers of mice. One thing I think is important to point out is lots of experiments with animals are done with, with smaller numbers, of three, four, five, six. These are 25 animals per group and they, um, it's really important to have a robust sample size that's properly powered in science. And they're also analyzed um, in a, what's called a blinded manner, meaning that the person analyzing the data doesn't know what treatment the animals got, whether they got the injury, whether they got the um, protective compound. And in fact, this is all um, objectively measured because it's all measured by a, a computer that tracks the mouse with a laser, so the, it's completely automated. So there's no opportunity for bias that might make us accidentally get the result that we were hoping that we would get. Uh, this last column here is the inactive enantiomer of 243. Just uh, recall that one of the advances of our latest version, um, 243, is that we can make both the right and the left-handed version. The, um, the R version completely protects the ability of the mouse to learn, um, and the other version is inactive. So in summary, we um, discovered a new neuroprotective molecule through uh, what we call a target agnostic screen, meaning that we didn't have any bias to how the molecule might work. We just wanted to find something that would work. We are in the process of trying to figure out how it exerts this protective effect. And we're also chemically optimizing the molecule for future drug development, and our hope is that it will work um, as a new therapeutic agent for people suffering from any, any of a wide variety of neurodegenerative diseases. So. So ideally, so it's everything is a balance, and we so far have been able to get rid of one of the bromines, but not both of them, and still retain activity. So that's just the reality. It's not that having a bromine is a complete contraindication to making a drug. But all of the people that we talk to who make drugs, they all say, if possible, you should try to get rid of those bromines. Well, at this stage, we haven't been able to do that. Now, maybe in the future, when we understand the molecule better, we can make new versions that don't have it. But this is the best that we have right now. Um, that being said, there are drugs that have bromines, and, and they work well. So it's just, it, it's, it, it's one of those things that would be preferable, but it's not an absolute. Right, so that's a good question. Um, and I actually didn't show a lot of, of the data here. So um, you would worry that something that were pro-proliferative might, like you say, cause cancer. This particular molecule is not pro-proliferative. It does not enhance the birth or the replication or it doesn't affect mitotic division. What it does is it blocks cell death. So we're not pro-proliferative with this one. Some of the other molecules we found are, are um, pro-proliferative, uh, different ones within the original screen. Um, and the, the other thing that is uh, really cool but unusual, and I think we'll, when we figure out the mechanism, we'll understand why, is that when we give this molecule to developing animals that normally should undergo a lot of cell death as part of the process of development of their brain, we don't block that normal cell death. We seem to only be blocking the pathologic cell death that occurs in these other diseases. And so, um, for some reason, we have intervened in some pathway that affects it like that. We've given the molecules for months at a time to both mice and to rats, and we've had them analyzed um, pretty rigorously, and we haven't seen any increased incidence in tumors. We've done that in both aged animals as well as young animals. So, Originally, we, we, we didn't actually administer it to the hippocampus. We put it into the, what's called the ventricular system of the, of the brain, which is the part that has cerebral spinal fluid that circulates between the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and that was how we did the screen. But this particular series of molecules that I showed, uh, called the P7C3 series, it can be given um, orally. So you can take it as a pill or as food. I was interested in knowing the time in terms of the effects of 243. I, I thought the chart said 30 days, the last one. I was just interested in all the time. What you have to give the molecule? How much time do you actually see the full effect? So, the you're talking about the 
when you say the 30 days, that was from the original oh, okay. schematic okay. diagram? Yeah. So the original screen <laughs> was exploiting the ability that the brain makes these new neurons in the hippocampus. And so the process of hippocampal neurogenesis takes 30 days from birth to maturity. We did a screen within a one-week period of time because a lot of those cells are 40% of the cells die that, by one week. And so the idea was to use the screen to find things that would either enhance proliferation or um, promote survival. Turns out that the P7C3 molecules promote survival, and that survival happens r right away. So um, for example, in the blast model of injury, we're seeing damage immediately after the, um, immediately after the blast wave goes through their brain. And so we're able to block that right away when we start administering the molecule. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I was saying over there is that it doesn't seem to. That's, that was a concern. And so we tried it. We, we gave it to animals um, starting on embryonic day 13, which is when the hippocampus is formed and the brain is still forming. We, we gave it to uh, pregnant uh, mothers and it crossed the placenta and got into the brains of the embryos. And then we gave, we gave it to them every day and we gave it to um, the animals while the um, newborns were nursing and it went through the breast milk, got into their brain. And then we, every day until they were three months of age, and it did not affect any of their normal apoptosis. So you're absolutely right, you do need normal apoptosis for development. And it could have, if it had blocked that, then those animals would have potentially had, you know, heads that were this big and they, they would have had webbed digits and, or they might not have even lived, but that wasn't the case. So for whatever reason, we just got really lucky, and it seems to be intervening in a, a pathological death process that's distinct from apoptosis, which is certainly possible. I mean, first of all, it's possible because that's what we see, but it's also possible because there are so many different mechanisms of cell death. Yeah. Um, you said that the hippocampus is most responsible for something like memory. Mm -hmm. So if you kept the cells alive and like kept uh, adding so that the memory could be improved, would that be able to fight off some symptoms of something like Alzheimer's with memory loss? That's one, that's one idea, yeah, is that whether, whether the particular cells that are born are responsible for the memory or whether it's just the proper functioning of the entire hippocampus. Um, but our hope is that by allowing cells to live instead of die as, as we age or as we have a disease, that we'll be able to preserve normal functioning. And so. Um, Increasing the robustness of the hippocampus could help prevent memory loss, is what we hope. Day 10, you stopped giving the, the animals the 243. Were they then killed and checked at day 10? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've checked them a lot. So have, have you kept them longer but not given them anymore to see if there's a residual effect of having gotten it for those days? That's, we're in the process of doing that right now. Yeah, this is all really, really recent okay. data. So. Yeah, the idea is, does it, does it wash out or, or have we induced a sustained change by protecting during that window of time? Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have radio labeled it um, and we're not quite sure where it goes. It seems to go everywhere. It seems to go everywhere. We're also um, we're trying a lot, of, a lot of different techniques to figure out the mechanism and stuff that I, I couldn't go into here, but by doing what's called a structure activity relationship study, SAR study. Um, what we did, what that is, is that you systematically vary the molecule in different regions and you learn when it destroys the activity of the molecule versus when the molecule can still work. If you're able to make a change and the molecule still works, then you know that you can add a different group to that part of the molecule. And so we're, we've identified those regions where we can change it and not lose activity and now we're putting on different uh, tagged, t different tags or handles or ways that we can hopefully fish out the target or see where it goes and, and investigate it more rigorously.